People will make time for other people, but they won't make time for themselves. And they will have all kinds of excuses. Oh, I gotta go to work, I have kids, you don't understand, blah, 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 this, that. But then when their friend calls him, do you want to go out for dinner? Sure, all of a sudden they can make time. Danapani and I met five years ago, I think, <laughs> because I didn't have Clara, our daughter. Back then. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So we met five years ago and I remember through EO uh -huh. in Hamburg. Yeah. And I remember one thing you said and I met you many times and you kept on saying where awareness goes, energy flows. Thank you for remembering those five words. It's amazing. It's only five words. And most people can't get that correct. I tell people it's the Monk 101 and I, I repeat this over and over. You've heard me speak a few times and I always repeat the same thing. And someone actually asked me recently, uh, why do you always share the same thing? Why don't you share new things? I'm like, why should I share new things when you don't even get the first thing I share <laughs> and practice it, right? No, literally, why, why share the next thing when you haven't even learned the first thing and practiced the first thing? And that's what today's well, and you know, everybody wants the next thing. They, they come, they listen to a course, they do part one, give me part two, they do part two, give me part three, but nobody's practicing part one. Nobody's practicing part one, nobody's living part one, but everybody wants the next thing. They want to check the box, I did this. They intellectually understand it or think they understand it, but they don't practice it at all. And why, do, why go to the next step when you haven't even done step one? If you can't get step one proper and live it, then why do step two? Mm. It's an absolute waste of time. That's now at this point, it's purely to satisfy your ego, right? To satisfy some need to tell people that, oh, I've already done this, I've done part one, I've done part two, I've done this course, I've done the advanced course, I've got this certification. But you don't live any of it, you know? Do you still practice it? The awareness and the mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. And you know, some days I don't do well, but it's one of the biggest things I practice, learning to control awareness in your mind. And this city is the perfect place. Yeah, that is right? true. Right now I'm getting distracted because there's a going an alarm on and off and I'm yeah. wondering like, okay, is it actually going to be fine? It's fine. It's part of New York. Not sure if I, if I may ask that you became a father three months ago. How did that change? things? Did it change your mind? Did it change? Yeah, it changed a lot of things. I think one of the biggest, I mean, there's so many things changed, but I would say one of the biggest things is that I became a lot more focused. And you know, I teach about focus. Right? Yeah. That's one of the big things I do. I yeah. talk to people about focus. I teach them how to focus and I feel like I'm fairly focused, mm -hmm. but ever since I've had a daughter, I've become even more focused. Because I do want to give her my undivided attention. You know, when I'm carrying her, I don't want to be on the phone. You know, I'm feeding her and I don't want to be on the phone. I want to be completely present with her. So now I have another person in my life that's taking up a few hours a day of my time, which I want to spend with her, right? I want to give her a few hours. So now I have 24 hours and you're taking out another three, four hours. Yeah. So now my day is so limited in what I get to do. So I really have to be so focused and make even more drastic choices of who I spend time with, what I say yes to, what I say no to. I used to travel a lot and speak, now I, I don't. Unless you're willing to meet some of my requirements, I'm not gonna go. What are your requirements? Oh, just, you know, before I would fly all the way to Africa for two events. Yeah. You know, it's a long trip. Or fly to Australia sometimes for one event. I've flown all the way from New York to Brisbane to speak for 40 minutes and then come back. Yeah, no. you don't do that anymore. No, I'm not going to do that, no. Because it takes two days to fly there. Yeah. And then you get there the day before, it's two days at the event, and then you fly back. It's six days. Yeah. I'm going to be away from the daughter for six days. So if there's, unless there's like four or five events back to back, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. You know, and just making a lot of choices in terms of who I spend time with even more strict.
So if someone's not investing their energy back into me, then they're not a priority in my life. Yeah. You know? How do you, how are people dealing with priorities today? Not very well. Uh, it's really interesting. I'll share a little story. I was walking here for the interview, so walking to the subway, and I was at a traffic light, and this lady turned and looked at me, and I was like, yeah, whatever. And, uh, and then we crossed, and then she was walking a little bit behind me, and then she came up next to me, and she goes, are you the guy with the YouTube videos? And I go like, which ones? And she's not the motivational ones. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that one. <laughs> Didn't know what YouTube video she was talking about. Anyway, she started talking and uh, we caught the same train. And one of the things she said is that, you know, I don't know what I want in life. Yeah. I have no idea what I want in life. So if you have no idea what you want in life, how then can you prioritize your life? You can't prioritize. And if you ask most people, what do you want in life? They're like, not oh, to be happy. Happiness is not a focus, you know, happiness is not a priority in life. Happiness comes as a byproduct of living a certain way. But first you have to be super clear of how you want to live your life. What is your life about? What's your purpose in life? And most people don't know. And because they don't know their purpose, then they don't know their priorities. The purpose defines your priorities. And once you have your clear of your purpose, your purpose defines your priorities. Once you know your priorities, then you can focus on them. But if you don't know your purpose, then you don't know your priorities. So to answer your questions, how are people dealing with priorities? Not very well, because most people have no idea what their priorities in life are. And then one thing she said to me on the train is that, well, she's talking about relationships, and she says, I know what I don't want in a man. I thought to myself, no, you don't. The only time you know when you don't want something is you know, is when you know what you want, right? When you know what you want, that's when you know what you don't want. If you don't know what you want, how can you know what you don't want? Does that make sense? That makes total right? sense. So when she said, I know what I don't want in a man, I'm mean, like, that's not clear. Because if I asked her, what do you want in a man? She has no idea. It's also, in a way, a very negative approach, right? Like right. seeing like, what you don't want instead of seeing the good. Like, what do I want? Yeah. Because sometimes there's also parts that maybe you don't want, but you can accept because you get the things that you do want. Exactly, right. Yeah. You know, so, uh, but yeah, most people never take any time to figure out what they want in life, so they don't know what their priorities are. How do you, we're talking about purpose now, finding purpose in life, and how do you practice finding, because your purpose is not something that is just there. A lot mm. of people give workshops on promise, like 45 minutes, and that is your purpose. purpose. Exactly, <laughs> they make tons of money. Yeah, probably. <laughs> how do you practice finding your purpose? How do you... I always tell people the simple way to start is to, uh, you know, uh, is to spend time with yourself. So, you know, I've spent time with you and your husband, you know, whenever I come to Hamburg. And the more time I spend with the both of you, the more I get to know you. But we haven't spent a lot of time. So whenever I'm in Hamburg, you know, we've, we've met on different occasions and stuff like that. But if I wanted to get to know you and Christoph really well, I have to spend time with both of you. So just say if I lived in Hamburg and every week we went out to dinner, or lunch, and I spent two hours with you and Christoph. Then after a year, the three of us would get to know each other very well. Because every week you're spending two hours with me, you know what I like, what I don't like, when I'm cranky, when I'm upset, what makes me happy. Most people never spend any time with themselves. So how would they know what they want in life? Right? So the only way I can get to know someone is by spending time with them. Right? So if you ask someone, how much time do you spend with yourself? Most people say, they don't spend any time. They say, oh, when I walk the dog, that's when I spend time. That's my alone time. I say, no, that's you walking the dog. Because on one hand, you're walking the dog. And then on the other hand, you're probably like on, on your phone. phone. Yeah, or um, if you live in New York, you're avoiding traffic, mm -hmm. you know, trying not to get run over. And so if some people say when I go to the gym, that's my alone time. No, you're lifting weights. You can't call that alone time. When I say alone time, I mean sitting down in your home quietly, no headphones, no music, no nothing, your eyes closed, maybe sitting cross-legged on the floor if you can, if not sitting on a chair, and just going inside and asking yourself questions, having a conversation. So like I would ask you and Christoph, like, you guys like to go into nature, right? 
in yeah. caravan and boat. We love sailing. You love sailing. sailing. Where sure. do you like to sail? You know, what's the toughest thing about sailing? You know, what are the challenges? All that kind of questions. And the more we talk, the more I find out. Yeah. So people don't do that. But it's so, and people say, oh, I don't have time for that. But it's so fascinating, right? If someone, all I say to people is spend five minutes with yourself every morning having a conversation the same way I would have a conversation with you and your husband. But people say they don't have time. But then if their friend calls them up and say, hey, do you want to go out for dinner? They'll say, sure, let's go out for dinner. And they'll spend two hours with their friend having dinner. Um, but they don't have time for themselves. Do you know how many five minutes they are in two hours? That's 24 five minutes segments. Yes. That means you can sit with yourself every day for five minutes for 24 days straight if you skip dinner. People will make time for other people, but they won't make time for themselves. And they will have all kinds of excuses. Oh, I gotta go to work. I have kids. You don't understand. Blah, blah, blah. This, that. But then when their friend calls them, do you want to go out for dinner? Sure. All of a sudden they can make time. So it's really about um, the relationship with yourself. Pretty much. And they don't value their life enough. You know, once you value your life and you realize, and I always say that life is finite. You know, life is not short, but there's a clear definitive end. And once you realize that life, once you realize that life is finite, then you start to make choices. You start to realize what is important. I have one life. I don't get a second shot at this. How do I want to live my life? How will I look back upon my life at do the end? Do we only have one life? I don't even. I, don't I believe in reincarnation. Yeah. Right. I don't, I, I, I'm just you're just saying the way. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't know. We had this discussion about. Religion and everything right. about two years ago, maybe yeah. a year ago or something. I don't know. Like I don't know. But I believe in reincarnation. But I have one life as Dunder Party. Yeah, absolutely. The next life I yeah. could be something. a German filmmaker. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Name MP. <laughs> and then he's like, <laughs> if I'm lucky, if my if I have good karma, <laughs> yeah. right? But I have one life as Dunder Party, and I want it to be a great life. And in order for me to live a great life, I need to be clear what I want in this life and I need to be clear what my priorities are. How do you think about, I'm thinking about workspace now, the relationship to yourself, um, that clearly none, like me, maybe 2% of the people live that, yeah. um, the relationship that you're pointing out. Um, and then it's also about the relationship to our colleagues and people around us. Um, and I do think that the more, how can we have relationships with each other? We're sitting in open space, we put these big screens and like between us, we put our cell phones there. How does this whole digital um, thing that's happening? Um, I was in the, uh, in the subway last night and I looked around and it's like everyone, like everyone, except one person on the cell phone was on the phone and in, it, in a way I was on the phone too I'm not saying I was different right. <laughs> I was on the phone too but it shocked me because I used to have relationship with people even on the subway um, just you know looking around picking up conversation yeah I think you know with the with technology in the workspace I think there are no guidelines right people people don't set up guidelines one of the things I talk about you know when I work with companies mm -hmm. and about cultivating focus is that there's no way to tell um, someone in the workspace, especially if you have an open floor, mm -hmm. open plan, floor plan, uh, that what's your status right now. So for example, do you use Skype or have you used Skype before? Skype before? Mm -hmm. Well, you can set your status as offline, busy, on a call, not available, mm -hmm. right? And when you see someone as offline, most of the time, I think most people will never try calling that person if they're offline or if they're not available, or it says do not disturb, you don't try and call that person, right? But in the workspace, in an open floor, open plan, floor plan, um, there's no way to set that status. There's no way to inform. So what happens is someone is working on their computer, they might be doing accounting, trying to solve some complex accounting uh, issue, and then someone comes up to them and goes, hey, John, uh, do you know where the photocopy paper is? So now he goes, 
oh, it used to be in this cupboard. I think they moved it over there. You know, have a look over there. He goes like, oh, thank you. So that guy goes to get the photocopy paper. Now John goes back to his accounting and he's lost his train of thought. You know, his awareness was so deep in it, trying to solve something complex. And now his awareness moved to the person to talk about photocopy paper. And now he comes back and he has to try and get back to where he was. And he may not. And if, especially if you're doing something creative, I remember working with a fashion company in LA and they said the same thing, you know, their designer is sketching the fall collection. Someone comes and asks them a question or says, hi, they turn, they say hello, they turn back to continue to sketch and now they've lost their mojo, they've lost their flow. So, because there's no way for the person working to tell that person what their status is. So one simple solution I tell companies is to have a simple flag. Like you drive on the street, there's traffic lights. Red means stop. Orange or yellow means go faster. No, prepare to stop, right? And green means go. Right. So what if you had a little flag on your desk? This is, as an example, you, yeah. it doesn't have to be a flag, but you had a little plastic flag on you. And you say red means do not disturb me. I am immersed in something really important. But what you do is within the department to say, if you're in the design department or the accounting department, there's 10 people in the accounting department. All 10 people have a meeting and we set the status as red means do not disturb. But below it, we, we outline the conditions upon which you can interrupt. Mm. So if the building is on fire, yes, you can disturb me and let me know, all right? If these conditions are not right. met, don't disturb me. Then if it's an orange flag, then you can say, okay, I'm doing something important, but it's not super important. So there's any, if these conditions are met, you can interrupt me. And if I have a green flag, it means I'm just working. If you want to come by and say hello, or you want to interrupt me, it's fine. So that way someone walking mm -hmm. will see a flag and go like, oh, it's a red flag. I shouldn't disturb that person. Mm -hmm. Now you increase productivity and efficiency in, in the workplace because there is a way to inform other people in the workspace what your status is, mm. right? If not, there's no way. Like I live, I grew up in Australia and, and in the beach in Australia, there's, there are flags. They put a red flag, means don't go in the water. It's really dangerous. There might be sharks. There might be great whites waiting to eat you. Yeah. Or there's a strong riptide or current, right? It's dangerous, don't go. We have that, at, like but we put headphones on Yep. If you have headphones up, you're not supposed to disturb someone, right. which works like 90% of the time. Right, but then that person needs to put something on them, yeah. even if they don't want to, right? Yeah. But if you could even hang something it's on the wall. It's an even better idea, absolutely. Right. So, I mean, we have meetings for, gui um, we have guidelines for meetings. Yep. We have guidelines for how to communicate, or we should at least, yep. but we don't have any guidelines on how to um, interact yep. with each other. Exactly. How to live relationships at home, in the office. Yeah. And the same thing, like even, even like workspace. So for, I, I live in an apartment in New York and I used to have a home office. Uh, one of the rooms in my apartment was an office. Now my daughter's taken over, so I got kicked out. But before that was my office. So I had a room in the apartment and that was purely my office. And that's where I worked. Mm -hmm. So if I need to send a text message or make a phone call, I go into that room. Yeah and do it. I don't do it in the kitchen. I don't do it in the living room. I don't do it in the bedroom because then my family knows if I'm in the living room, I'm just hanging out. That's where I watch TV. I don't have a TV. I watch Netflix on my computer or I'm hanging out with my family. If I'm in the kitchen, then I'm, I'm home. But if I'm in the workroom, office, then I'm working. Mm. So it's very, very clear boundaries. And I think workspaces should have that too, you know, because if you don't, then what ends up happening is that you make every space in the workspace a work area. There might be some offices that have nice relaxation rooms where people can go relax, but then you'll find people talking about work in there. Do you see that a lot, that, pe that companies have quiet zones, meditation rooms. I hear about it because I don't work in a large company like that, but you know, I've heard uh, people that work in companies that have quiet rooms or play rooms or hangout rooms, right? And, and then people just end up defaulting and talking about work. 
Yeah. So before we establish a quiet zone or something, yeah. we should have guidelines on how to behave in a quiet room. Yeah, well, what, what, what you, you should even talk about in a, in the quiet zone. Probably nothing, because it's a quiet zone. Yeah, oh, it's a quiet zone, if it's just a hangout room. So maybe in your office you have a, a room with a few sofas mm. and magazines and, you know, people can sit down and chat. But then you can say, yeah, you, here you can hang out with your workmates. But the one rule is there's no work conversations are allowed in this room at all. Because where awareness goes, energy flows. So if you bring your awareness, if you come to the hangout room and your awareness goes to the work area of the mind, that's where the energy is flowing and now the vibration in the room becomes work related. And then it doesn't feel like a relaxed room anymore. I had a neighbor in my building and she used to say to me like, oh, I work in the university and then I come home and then I work from home and I always feel like I'm always working. And I said like, oh, when you're back home, where do you work? She says, oh, sometimes I work, we have a small, she said, I have a small home office, but then sometimes I work in the kitchen, sometimes I work on my bed, sometimes I work in the living room. Now your whole home has become an office. So that's why you never feel any relaxation because there's nowhere to relax. Your whole house, your whole home has become a workspace because that's where your awareness is going. The energy flows there and that energy becomes a work-related energy. How do you bring back your awareness? By setting clear guidelines that you don't work when you're in the living room. So when I'm in my living room, I just do not work. I don't. If I need to send an email, I need to send a text message, then I go to my office and I do it. I also mean in your... And like, if you don't have right, a home right office... Right now, for yeah. example, right? Yeah. My awareness is like I'm trying to be... I have 100% focus here. Yeah. And then I can see my... For a second, I can see it going, why are they working on the streets? But I'm trying to get it... How do you, how do you bring it back? By like developing in, willpower during the day, like how do I bring it back when I see I'm awareness like, drifting away? Yeah, awareness drifting away. By developing willpower. Because your willpower, I define willpower as your mental muscle, right? So if I could draw biceps around my mind, that would be my willpower. How do you train it? Train? How do you develop willpower? Yeah. Simple ways to finish what you begin, right? Every time you finish what you start, you're developing willpower. Because it's so easy to start a project, but to finish it is much harder. So the three of you have an idea, let's go to New York and do interviews. That's exciting, right? Full of ideas, we'll do this, we'll do that, <laughs> we'll do this, we'll go here, we'll fly in a helicopter, we'll shoot this. <laughs> that, was <MP. laughs> that was MP. That was MP. Then you come here, you have a great time, you shoot, <laughs> right? Then in a few days on Sunday, you get on a plane and you fly back to Munich and then to Hamburg, right? How do you know? <laughs> I know things, uh, special powers. <laughs> I also talked to MP before the interview. <laughs> so you're exhausted, you get home, you're jet lag. Now you have other work things, your family's there. Now to finish what you begin is going to be a lot of work. To take all these hours and hours of footage, to go through everything, to edit it, it's going to be so painful, right? And then to do it better than you think you can and to do it a little bit more than you think you can. The first interview, you'll do a nice job. The second one, by the fourth and fifth one, you're going like, oh my God, I have like 10 hours of footage here. I have to sit and go through. But to finish it and do it better than you think you can and to do more than you think you can takes tremendous amount of willpower. So every time you finish what you begin, you're developing willpower. You take that same willpower, every time your awareness drifts away, you bring your awareness back. Right? It's a mental muscle. Your awareness drifts away again, you bring it back. And the city is a perfect place because there's a million things happening. Yeah. You walk down the street, awareness is ready to run around like a dog. Yeah. Right? On a leash. So you, you have to use your willpower and bring your awareness back. Because the key thing is when you control your awareness, you're controlling where your energy is going, right? Where awareness goes, energy flows. So if you control where your awareness goes, you control where your energy is flowing. If you control where your energy is flowing, you control what's manifesting in your life. You want something to grow, you put energy into it. You don't put time, you put energy into it. How do you put energy into it? 
by controlling where your awareness is going. And then that thing starts to manifest in your life. But you can only put your awareness onto something if you know what your priorities are. You know what to focus on. So if you learn to focus but you don't know what to focus on, then... It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So coming back to your earlier point, people need to figure out what their priorities in life are. But your priorities in life are defined by your purpose in life. Your purpose defines your priorities. Your priorities allows you to know what to focus on. And then once you can focus on your priorities, now you're living in alignment with your purpose. The by when you live in alignment with your purpose, the byproduct of that is happiness. Right? Happiness is a byproduct of living a certain lifestyle. Right? You go boating or camping with your family, you where feel do, happy. Where do you go? What is your... Happiness? Yeah, place. Um, well, I uh, just got back from Costa Rica mm -hmm. at midnight. Mm -hmm. I know, I yeah. we really, really appreciate it. Oh, you're most welcome. Ten hours ago. Time. Yeah, so the last... We followed you. You had yeah. some, some uh, nice projects going on, planting projects. Right. Right? Yeah, this time we didn't plant. This time we were doing... Now it's the dry season, so we were doing a lot of landscaping. Yeah. So we have 33 acres yeah. and we're building a garden, a botanical garden and a spiritual uh, retreat center. Nice. So that's my happy place. So for the last 12 days, I've been uh, going through the jungle with a machete and cutting things and uh, seeing snakes and getting bitten in the face, by, oh. stung in the face by bees oh. and bitten by insects. And that makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> because it makes you feel alive? No, I just love, I love nature. Yeah. And I love uh, creating and building something beautiful. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we've been working on the project for four and a half, five years now. And so many of the trees that we planted, we basically took this abandoned land mm -hmm. that was all, that had been cut down decades ago for cattle pasture. Mm -hmm. And then they got rid of the cows, the cattle. And then now we have just weeds growing. And when, if you saw the original picture of the land, it just looks terrible. And now it's such a beautiful garden. All these trees are growing, we have flowers and fruits, and so many animals are coming into the property now that we never used to have. Is it already, the, you mentioned it's a retreat center? Yeah. Is it finished already? Like, do people go there? Is it no, finished? we haven't what started is, construction yet. Right. Yeah. What is the... Time frame? Mm -hmm. Well, we hope in the next five to seven years, we have a 50-year plan for the retreat center and a 300-year plan. Wow. So we're not rushing. I was yelling at Christoph the other day because he wanted to make a three-year plan. Now you tell me you have a 50-year plan. I'm like, oh my God. And a 300-year plan. <laughs> so yep. um, do you want to move there sometime? Yeah, we hope yeah. to move in the next two years. Yeah, so the first thing we're going to build is a home. Mm -hmm. And then we'll start building all the other, the other pieces. But that makes me really happy. I just love doing that. I love creating and building things. You know, and finishing and making something really beautiful and nice. Yeah. Because, you know, you can do a quick job. When you, when you want to do something really quickly, you don't end up doing something nice. But if you take your time to build it, you will build something really beautiful. And the most beautiful things on this planet took a long time to build. You know, the pyramids, ancient temples and churches in Europe, you know, that you see that are so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Those weren't built in one day. Uh, one year and today everybody wants to build things overnight let's get this project done and i've had so many friends and entrepreneurs that say to me hey you know we can finance this thing let's get this project done in one year and i know if i finish it in one year it will not look as beautiful if i took my time to build it because now i can think about every little detail really plan it out slowly but i will create something beautiful that will last hopefully 50 300 years from today, you know, that people come and they go like, wow, this is very beautifully thought through. You know, if I just build it so that people can come, because everybody's thinking, right, yeah, build a retreat center so people can come and be in this place. No, I want to create something beautiful and I'm willing to take time. Thank and I so. plant trees that I will never enjoy. You know, some of the trees will only get big and beautiful when I'm dead. But somebody will enjoy, your children will enjoy. 
your grandchildren or great grandchildren will enjoy it, but I never will. And you might enjoy as a German filmmaker. I might enjoy it as a German filmmaker in my next <laughs> reincarnation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. You're most welcome.